Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We will begin our program. If you could uh, try and find a, a seat. Good afternoon and welcome. I am Marsha Hashimoto, president of the Watsonville Santa Cruz Japanese American Citizens League. Thank you for joining us today for this celebration of the 30th anniversary of the passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. This was also called House Resolution 442, 442, uh, in uh, honor of the 442nd Nisei Regimental Combat Team. We will begin our program with a song that has been a favorite of our senior members. The song is God Bless America. It's been their favorite since World War II. There were few who spoke in our support against the incarceration of Japanese Japanese Americans during World War II. Our only supporters were the Quakers, local churches, and a few individuals, like singer Kate Smith. Kate Smith, during World War II, she had a radio program and later had a television program. And her theme was God Bless America. She was one of the few that spoke up against our uh, unjust treatment during World War II. So in gratitude to Kate Smith, and as an expression of our patriotism to the United States of America, our seniors, our Issei pioneers, learned this song phonetically by writing it out in Japanese. So please stand if you are able to, if not, that's fine, but please join us in singing God Bless America. The seniors do it twice, so we'll do it just as they do every Thursday and at each of their events. We'll sing God Bless America twice, and, and, uh, we, and we hope that you will be able to join us. Thank you. We have a little music accompanying us. Second Regimental Combat Team and founder and president of the Friends and Family of Nisei Veterans. San Benito County JCL President Kurt Kurosaki, Kurt, can, I know Kurt is here, and our dear friend Pasco Kurosaki. You may hold your applause until we're, <laughs> until we're uh, completed. 
Cabrillo College trustee and Watsonville Santa Cruz JCLer Leticia Mendoza. Chairman of the Monterey Board of Supervisors, Luis Salejo. Watsonville Mayor, Lowell Hurst. City Council members, Rebecca Garcia, Felipe Hernandez, and Aurelio Gonzalez. And a special guest, Catherine Kitty Mizuno. She is our Quaker friend, Watsonville Santa Cruz J. Sieller, and her grandfather, Harold Evans, was the lawyer who represented Gordon Hirabayashi before the Supreme Court of the United States of America in May 1943. Kitty, there she is. Act of 1988 verified that the incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Japanese Americans during World War II was a grievous civil rights violation based on racism, failure of our nation's leaders, and an unfounded declaration of military necessity. The apology enabled the beginning healing, healing process of our Japanese Japanese Americans incarcerates. The highlight of today's event is the presentation of a magnificent painting by our dear friend, Howard Ikemuro, he's a retired Cabrillo College art professor. Howard is unable to be with us because of health reasons, but we are honored and pleased to welcome our guest of honor, Jean Ikemuro. Jean. May I direct your attention to the back area of the hall. To view how many kimonos, breathtaking work of art, the guard tower. We are extremely grateful to our Watsonville Santa Cruz board member, Joe Rose, for designing and constructing the perfect frame for Howard's guard tower. Joe donated his time and the cost of all the materials for this amazing project. Joe, can you uh, come forward? There he is. Here's Joe. Joe <laughs> and board members Gary Hina, Victor Kimura, and Nora Swidford, who assisted Joe in putting the painting in place, please receive our applause of gratitude. Can you can you practice? <laughs> if I may for a moment share how important and committed Joe Bose is to our JCL and our community. For decades, Joe has served on our board as the leader of our Keys Go Home maintenance crew, assisted by Gary, Victor, Iwao Yanashka, Norris and Paul Kaneko. Joe also organizes his crew to maintain the memorial garden at the Salinas Rodeo Grounds, where Japanese Japanese Americans in the Monterey Bay region were initially incarcerated. Joe is a retired highway patrol officer and is a master craftsman in constructing nearly a thousand drums, I heard, for our Watsonville and other Taiko groups. One of his greatest works is the huge drum. Do you see that huge drum in the back area? That's, that's a magnificent piece of art there. And it's Joe dedicated that huge taiko drum to the late Shid Kiska, who was a veteran of the Heroic 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Thank you, Joe, for being a vital part of our JCL family. Thank you, Joe. Real College. 
and is also known as Marcus Udu. <laughs> Several of you may have been, enjoyed traveling with Sandy to various parts of Asia. He is the author of many books that have documented the history of our Asian population in the Monterey Bay region. And we declare that Sandy is more knowledgeable about our historical roots than we ourselves are. Sandy has received numerous prestigious awards, but he states that the one that means the most to him is our chapter's Mike Masaoka J.A.C. Alcreed Award, presented in 1987 for his contribution and support of our community, particularly on behalf of our redress efforts. So I introduce to you Sandy, who is a longtime friend and colleague of Howard Yamoto's, and Sandy will be speaking about the power of art. Sandy? You've been, you've been baiting with the switch. You thought that was the front. <laughs> so when you went to church, remember when you went to church late and you stood in the back and you tried to sneak in and out and not be seen? You guys were all busted. <laughs> you got it. Um, and and in, in honor of my roots, Oscar San Benito County, Go Baylors, you know, the whole thing. Um, so I'm going to take off my jacket, but I needed to wear it in the beginning because I knew Moss would, and I needed to be at least even with uh, Moss. And I, I noticed, uh, Luis, is Luis not here? Luis, Luis dresses up too, I don't know if you know. And, and low, I mean, they, politicians know. You know. But it's also because they're going to 14 events every afternoon, and so he's got to be like a community. He has to go from this to Lord knows where, um, but I, I, before he gets away, because I know he has to leave, um, I want to say that um, the Monterey County Board of Supervisors in February of this year did something unprecedented, unprecedented, uh, when not only did they reaffirm reascending something I'm going to talk about later that was on the books, but they issued a formal apology to the Japanese community um, in Monterey County for the actions that the County of Monterey had taken during World War II. Um, and that was instigated by that well-dressed troublemaker over there. Uh, who, He was a student, and, uh, Luis was a student of Moss, and Moss said, no, but his mother was. Well, <laughs> if you want to do some interesting man, he was also a former student of mine, and so what does that mean? <laughs> well, but he came to my class later, he was actually, he was actually running for the uh, city council in Watsonville at the same time he was taking my Friday night class. And I'd seen him sitting up there, you know, he never missed a class, he was taking notes, he was doing the thing. And I kept saying to him, dude, you should be out, you know, campaigning. What are you doing here? There's no votes in here. <laughs> but what was happening was, we were laying down tracks in his memory disc, if you will. Because when he went on to the assembly, he helped pass a, an apology and a resolution for the Chinese, uh, also for the Filipinos. He, he's named on highways if you drive down 101, uh, which is one of my favorite things. Well, not one of my favorite things to do, but uh, when you're in Monterey County and you're going down near Chulalar, um, you'll also see a recognition of the Braceros, uh, who were killed in that terrible bus accident uh, you know, back in the 60s. Um, and not to be outdone, of course, this time he's uh, doing the Japanese. Um, as chairman of the board, um, and um, uh, Monterey County's lucky to have him. Dude, go to where you gotta go. <laughs> so what I was gonna say, now that it, when, once he leaves, I can take off my coat. Uh, <laughs> see, that was, that's what, hold on, I know. Smoke him if you got him. No. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, now we can now we can get to work here. A um, couple of things, couple of things, I, and I'm, I'm I'm honored to be involved with this organization, um, in order to San Benito County and JACL National. Um, but I don't want you to miss the import of this organization, the Santa Cruz Watsonville Japanese American Citizens League. Um, this, you know. Mas always says, uses the word inaka, which in Japanese means country. He says, you know, we're just a, we're just a little country. We're just a little country JACL chapter. What, are you kidding me? This is a powerhouse. You are in, you know, you might be misled by looking at all the nice foo-foo and the, the things and everything. This is a civil rights organization, the likes of which doesn't exist most anywhere else in the country. Um, for example, I don't know if you know this. See, I'm supposed to at least tell you one thing you didn't know before the afternoon's over. Um, this is the fourth largest JACL chapter in the United States of America. Fourth largest. Portland <laughs> and Seattle. And then Watsonville, San Francisco. <laughs> totally cool. Um, they have been doing things while you're sleeping or resting or not paying attention, um, constantly. And one of the things they've been working very hard on is, um, and actually one of the manifestations of it, the, the booklet that came out of the event, I'll, I'll bring it and wave it. It's not in print, you can't find it. That's what you do, you show people things you, they can't buy. Uh, but this, this is the booklet that came out of the 2002 reenactment. In 2002, actually long before 2002, in this very room, does this look like a revolutionary headquarters to you? <laughs> because that's what it is. Um, a committee sat down and said, you know, we're coming up on an anniversary. Why don't we see if we could reenact um, the removal, the actual departure of the Japanese community in Watsonville? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I mean, a lot of people went, you know, you know God. Um, the Eminems, I call them the Eminems, Moss and Marsha. Uh, the Eminems are always cooking up stuff. So, so we started to work on this. And um, we started, and, and what we discovered was that everyone in the city government had been a, was a former student of Moss, because Moss taught in high school forever. Um, so that helped. Because when we needed approval for everything, there was somebody there saying, how you doing, Mr. Hashimoto? Uh, I remember you back in, you know, 1928 or whatever. <laughs> so, 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 um, so we're trucking along, and we're, we're shooting for April of uh, 2002. And in September of 2001, 9-11, and we had to stop. We had a meeting right in this room. Right. A lot of life's blood is in in this room. Um, and we decided that it was, uh, we needed to do it. Now, more than ever, particularly when we saw the response that was going toward the, um, anybody who looked like uh, the people who were flying those airplanes, which is what happened in 1941, um, as soon as the people who, you know, who looked like the guys flying the airplanes in Pearl Harbor, um, we were the ones that went to camp. So, so we thought now more than ever. And, and I have to say about the JACL, the JACL was the first national organization that evening that came out as there were people being uh, accosted because they were Sikhs or, or, you know, Lebanese or whatever, because the Americans aren't good at this. We're, we're just not good at figuring out who's who. Um, and striking out in anger. Uh, and the JACL came out and said, knock it off. Um, we know, we know better than you all about what happens when people are identified by the way they look um, and are targeted by the United States. So, um, JACL right on the front of it. So I wanted to make sure you understood. And then the JCL, as we got closer, we held new reenactment. It was, and in fact, this is a result um, this painting is a result of the reenactment. This 
Um, there were three of Howard's um, towers, uh, one in the foyer of the Mello Center, and then two on the stage um, that was looming over um, the whole event. Um, but we began to realize that um, there were other things going on. And this anti-Muslim thing was beginning to run. Um, and um, so we, last year, um, the JACL sponsored a forum over at Cabrillo, co-sponsored with Cabrillo, um, uh, on an anti-Muslim forum. We had Muslim representatives coming in from the Bay Area. Um, and you know, the JACL is always on, this, 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 this JACL is on top of it. Um, and they just came back from the national uh, convention, um, Mas and Marsha, and um, uh, we're proud to say that the, um, the, the national JACL took a position opposing the, um, the, the Muslim ban, the Muslim travel ban, um, and, and apparently unanimous. Um, these, these are fraught political times, folks. This is, and it's a good thing we're, we're having this conversation today, and I'm hoping that we can make some sense out of it. One of the things that Moss and I have always said, we're both old, you know, old fire teachers, okay? We've been teaching forever. He, he earlier than me, um, and um, we look at each other every once in a while and say, you know, I didn't think we'd be doing this forever. We're still doing it. We're still telling the story. And we thought, you know, maybe, maybe we could retire. I, my wife is an ex, excellent dog trainer, and she's also trying to use her devices on me. It doesn't really work as well. Um, you know, we haven't gotten to the electric power on me yet, but soon. Um, and, and her thing is, you know, she catches me not walking correctly or something. She says, anytime, anywhere. That's dog trainer for you just don't go for a walk. You're always working with the dog. That's moths. Anytime, anywhere, if anybody asks him, and it doesn't matter how large a room, how, where it is, whatever, he goes there. He does it. Um, and, and I've often thought that this is one of the ways that he has is working off and working out of his his past, his background. He was a kid, and he was in camp. Kids in camp never leave it, but they manifest how they deal with it differently, and I'm not a psychologist, but, um, so I think Moss has his way, um, and, and I, his calendar is a zoo, I mean, I, I've looked at his calendar, you, there's, no, you know, and he's going everywhere, he's going the other day, he can, and sometimes he forgets where, where the event actually is. And so sometimes he has to leave really early, which is a very Japanese thing, by the way. You, 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 you try to get there early, but in his case, he's make sure you can find it. Uh, so um, Howard was working in his way. You know, those of us of this demographic, if you were born, you can do the math, but you figure 35 on. Um, and or born up to 1945, and you're of Japanese ancestry, the odds are, the odds are, that you were in camp during, during the time that you were a child, or born in um, You've got those two things. And anytime I take a group to Japan and I have to get birthdays from the group that's going with us, and we have Japanese Americans go with us, and, and sometimes they'll say, well, you know, my birthdays, because I need to know. Um, you know, 1943. Well, I know what that means. Um, and, it, and in Howard's case, born in 39, as was I, go ahead, do the math. Jesus, he's old. Yeah. Um, that, um, that that's, that's a strata in their personal archaeology. That's not bad, huh? Did you get that part about the archaeology? Um, you know, that, that they have with them forever. And how they deal with it is, is I think, part of the story. And I want to get to that. Yeah. And, um, so here's the deal. We thought it was going to be over. In 1988, they passed. They did it. They did everything they would do. They apologized. They got a reparations. They got, 
You got to get them for money. Boy, there was a huge debate in the Japanese community about that, by the way. There were a lot of people, a lot of people said, don't even bring it up. But then another group said, but okay, but not the money. Don't get them for Yes, get them for the money. They understand money. Um, you know, that, that <clears throat> had nothing to do with what they needed as much as it <clears throat> You, you want to get a little bit of a symbol there. Um, and then there was the educational program, right? It was built in, it had wheels, it was going to run. 30 years later, we're still here. And I began to think, and I got it, I was doing TV, and on the 19th of February, I think it was 1990, um, I was supposed to be doing the weather, but I, I got in the studio and got to do other stuff. And I did a thing on the executive order, 906 And I took a photographer out um, to the Rodeo uh, Grounds in Salinas. And I did a whole little bit on what February 19th means to the Japanese and Japanese American community. Um, the phones rang off the hooks. I, it was, you know, I got back to the studio, we did a live shot, so I get back to the studio and there's, everybody that's in the building is picking up the phone. Um, that'll give you an idea how long ago it was because they had to pick up the phone. See, they would you know, pick up the phone more, but anyway, they, uh, and I realized, and it was something they, I said, well, who was it? Can you tell they didn't identify themselves? So I said, a lot of guys, a lot of older guys. And I began to realize that there was another strata in people's lives, and particularly people who fought uh, and served in World War II, uh, including my father, who, who couldn't let go, could not let go completely. I tried to work him, I, oh God, uh, so hard um, to just try to, he, he was a farm advisor, he understood. In fact, he always said that the Japanese farmers in San Benito County are the best farmers in the world. But he said, but, but they're still, and then he used that, the short word, the, the J word, the, the short one that I cannot, for the life of me, ever use. Because um, he knew he could deal with me. You know, he could be, you know, you know a smart kid, what's this? I, I, and I realized that that generation is going to have to pass. That, that once that generation passes, because you, you, you can almost forgive some of them. I mean, it's just okay. You can't disconnect them. You don't understand the difference between the guys at the tan and the and the, and the strawberry farmers in the Paro Valley. Okay, fine. Um, but but we're going to outlive you. And but that's not it, because I discovered and sort of invented for myself that there's a virus. There's a virus of the racism that lays right along the spine of America. Frequently dormant, comes comes full bloom. I mean, viruses bloom. That's not my medical people I don't know that metaphor, but but at various times, high unemployment, boom, the virus starts to crank, and then then people look around and see who to blame for the unemployment, um, and or it can be called forth, right? I mean, someone can blow a whistle and get those viruses to pop. So what I've come to is that Moss and I can never stop. We can't stop doing this. And you all can't stop. Um, we're, we're, we're not going to eradicate it. You can't. But you can confront it. You can mitigate it. You can dampen it. Um, then you can outvote it. Uh, but that's a different, that's a different deal, right? But that, that, I don't want to get political here, for God's sake. Never, never get political and never really do that. So, Howard. Howard Ikimoto, born the same year as I, 1939. Um, he grew up in Sacramento, and uh, by the luck of the draw in a Japanese American family, um, uh, in 1942, um, his family was was marched off, uh, ultimately, to camp, um, to a concentration camp, which I, I forever will use uh, the phrase um, that has been discussed and litigated, and you, meet, you, you can't imagine the meetings that have gone on um, about the phrase concentration camp. But ultimately, both historically and also with Negotiations with other 
communities have experienced camp and used the phrase concentration camp, generally the acceptance, if you want to know, the general acceptance is you, you can designate it as America's concentration camp. Okay, that takes care of Europe. In other words, because they were concentration camps. They were prison, right? Um, and so Howard got to go. See, whenever he says, oh, you get to go to camp, don't think they're going to camp. They're not going to camp. They're going to camp. Um, and so every, every Japanese American in, in, you, you ever meet will, will use the word. Um, don't misunderstand. They're going to jail. All right? Without due process, without any of that. Okay. So Howard, and again, by the unfortunate lack of the my, my wife's from Sacramento, um, and I, but it, it was Howard's unfortunate thing that he was from Sacramento because the Sacramento community went to Tule Lake. Okay, so there's two things I want to teach you a little bit about. I want to teach you a little bit about Howard. I want to tell, tell you how I came to, to know and love the man. Um, and I also want to, talk, want to teach you about this painting. This is not just any tower. In the trade, where we all converse with each other about this event and World War II, <coughs> it's short. Thule. Thule has, the word has a feel about it. Thule Lake, the Thule Lake Concentration Camp, where it's now called the Thule Lake Segregation Center, was the largest and the most long-lived of all the camps of the 10 major um, concentration camps. Um, and in my career, as I, I came to Rio uh, two years after, after Howard. Howard came in 66, 1966, I came in 1968. In fact, next month, 50 years um, um, since I got to Cabrillo, there's no plaques. Um, I keep waiting for some plaque to go up, you know, name something. But they got all, they, they, the board of trustees wouldn't let people name anything except the library, Robert E. Swenson Library, um, and the Carl Connolly uh, football field. But most everything else is generic and has a number. Um, the art department, of which he was a member, Howard was a member, uh, we had a vice president that we really liked. Man named Floyd Younger. We loved Floyd Younger. And we wanted to name a building after Floyd when, after he passed away. Um, well, they would let us. So the art department, in a little bit of gorilla art, and that's not gorilla, but gorilla, um, made a plaque and stuck it on top of it and glued it to the top of a beam down in the art department building. Out of sight, but there. Um, I don't know if it's still there. It would be nice to know. We'll do a little secret history of Cabrillo sometime. We'll take people on tours and show you what, what they really need. Um, so Howard, Howard came ahead of me. And in my career, I came sort of sideways into this subject, into the Japanese immigration story. Um, I've been at the East West Center in Hawaii, and I, I was a, a graduate student and a scholarship student there. And I began to realize that because Hawaii told me, you know, it was the paradise of the Pacific. And I, I kept seeing, wait a minute, wait a minute. First of all, that makes me nervous. And second, you know, it can't be true. And then secondly, there's something going on here. Well, of course, there was something going on there. Um, and I came in through the Chinese immigrant story. Uh, and because the people that I taught, the, the old Hawaiians kept saying, oh, no, we, we, we loved everybody. We, everybody came. I said, no, wait, no, that can't be right. This is the 60s, right? Civil rights were, were starting to get a little itchy. And that's so why I looked it up, and sure enough, anti-Chinese movement was rampant in Hawaii, huge in Hawaii. Um, so I eventually came here, did the Chinese here, um, and then obviously moved uh, chronologically. Uh, to the Japanese. My language training was in Japanese, and I spent a lot of time in Japan and back and forth. Still do. Um, so, so Howard, Howard was in another department, and, and Howard, obviously was a Japanese American, had that name, um, and he and I came to this sort of gently. I had a feeling that Howard, Howard was working on something. Well, obviously he's working on his art, um, but. <coughs> 
you have to be careful. You be careful with people and the subjects. And the, and the subject of the concentration camps is not a happy subject. So he and I found a common ground in fishing. Um, he worked in Sacramento. Well, you got to be a fisherman if you grew up in Sacramento. Man, got to, there's the river. Okay. So, um, but he was a big river fisherman. He was a steelhead fisherman, but he went up to the big rivers, and I did. I just soaked up Creek, San Lorenzo River, you know, Aptos Creek. Um, and I actually introduced him. One day I come up climbing out of the SoCal Creek and he said, what are you doing? I had my graders on and my rod. He said, what are you doing down there? He happened to be standing there. I said, I'm fishing. He said, that's not big enough. No, it's just the big words. And he said, little thing. And I said, dude, tomorrow, come. I'll show you. And I did. And we became good friends. But the subject of his childhood hovered and it didn't really come forth until one day and we're sitting, and he asked me, because he knew I knew the history of the event, of the, and he said, tell me about the tanks at Thule. <clears throat> I didn't know about the tanks at Thule. It, it, you know, I, I could name all 10, 10 camps in order, my populations, I knew, I knew all the resolutions, I knew 9066 forward and backward, and you all, I didn't know about the tanks at Thule. So I said, um, you know, I bluffed and said, well, you know, there were, you know, and it's way up there. Well, he knew where it was, he was there. Um, so I looked it up, which began for me a whole revelation. Thule was a different place. Thule was tough. And it was tough because, and I know you're going to find this hard to believe, because the United States government made some stupid decisions. I'm sorry, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I know the government knows what they're doing. Um, you can ask the parents who so still love their kids. Um, so what they had done is, okay, they arrest the people and take them to camp. And what was the reason? Because they couldn't tell loyal from disloyal. They said, okay, since we can't tell loyal from disloyal, you all have to go. It makes it easy. Um, because how do you determine who's loyal and who's not? But when they got into camp, then the government invented a questionnaire and gave them a written questionnaire which said, gave them a chance to prove that they were loyal or not. And it has the infamous questions 27 and 28, which some of you probably know. Um, and it basically asked every person in the camp, to ask them to answer uh, whether they would serve in the United States military. Okay, you got Issei, first generation, Aliens not eligible to become citizens who are filling out a questionnaire that asks them if they are willing to serve in the United States military. Okay, that, that just for starters. Um, so those two questions become a lightning rod in all the camps. But mostly a tool. And, and I've not seen a real good analysis of this yet um, as to why. Because it created a sort of subculture within the Japanese incarcerated communities called the no-nos. If you answered no and no, 27 or 28, uh, or you didn't answer the questionnaire at all, you refused. There were people who just refused. And they were arrested up at Thule and taken to county jail. So they're already in jail. And they take them to another jail um, and charge them with the violation of the Espionage Act which is the act that is currently frequently mentioned by the United States government, which was passed during World War I. I know a lot of US history that you kind of forgot or maybe didn't know. Um, okay, so, so now you've got the highest percentage of no-nos, of people who just said no or refused, was a two. So then the United States government decides, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll get all the other no-nos, we'll get the no-nos out of all the other camps, and we'll send it to two. And, we'll, and so we'll have all the no-nos there together. <clears throat> Which does two things. First of all, it creates a really interesting situation at Tule Lake. Because there were people, I know you're going to find this hard, but there were people who were angry. Who were angry about being in prison without due process. See, don't be misled by the pleasant faces of the people in the JACL that you might meet. Because there, there is a residual anger which is, which is palpable. Um, 
they were betrayed by their government. Right? And then the government goes up and says, well, we're going to try to prove that you're loyal anyway. Well, that doesn't work. Um, creates a whole other class. So you've got all the, all the angry people in one place, and then you create a whole other class of, now there's going to be new angry people pop up in all the other camps. So, so it, it, it was stupid. The, Thule, the, the, the climate at Thule Lake, the climate of which this painting and our Ikimoto was born, literally, was the most contentious, most miserable, overcrowded, bad conditions. There were riots, there were demonstrations, they, wanted, they had to put them under martial law, um, and the tanks. They brought tanks up, and they parked one right in front of the gate, aimed at the camp. Right? We still don't know if it was just a dummy or, you know, it was a, 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 not an active act, a tank, but it but a, but was a, a, a real one. Um, and that's where Howard spent his childhood. Um, I was able, rarely, and I didn't push. I didn't push. I, I, I loved Howard Kimono. I loved Howard Kimono. I, but what I realized was he needed to, he needed to work this. And, it was not, and, and in some ways, you know, I'm just an academic looking for anecdotes, you know. Um, he, he, can, he can ignore me. That, that's good. But then it began to blossom. It began to pump. And it has pumped. <clears throat> and this is just one. Some of his paintings that he did of his memories at Tuli um, are astonishing. Powerful. <coughs> there was one that he did on, uh, uh, called Fourth of July, Tuli, of a of a parade, but it's not a parade. And it's hanging in the library at Cabrillo College um, by virtue of the gift of George Howe Jr., who is here today. George, where are you? I don't know. Anyway, thank you, George, for because he had already painted the painting, and George saw it and said, Can can we get another? <laughs> That's like an artist. Because it's huge. It's a really big painting. And you can almost see how he went. Oh, guy, I think this over again. Um, but he did, with the permission of the uh, owner of the original, and it hangs now. And that's what art does. You know, students go up and down those stairs. They never consciously, right? But maybe, maybe later they'll come to them. Maybe they'll see it. There's another place on the Cabrera campus, also by virtue of George Downey Jr. Martin Luther King, his, his confidence is there in bronze uh, by Mary McLean, who was a faculty member at the rail, and um, overlooking the little courtyard in front of the, what was the old theater, um, every day, all the time, 24 hours a day, you go through that campus, and Martin Luther King's eyes are going to follow you right, right across the campus. It's like you're never alone. Art is incredibly powerful. Those of us who do these kinds of things, this blows in the wind, you're going home, and eventually a week from now you won't remember a thing. All right? We know that. Um, we're just trying to, you know, re rehearse for ourselves. <laughs> we're talking to ourselves mostly. Um, but, but it's true that art will prevail. So when arts, when, art, when um, Howard Sale came up last year, um, when he did his last show, um, and got everything out that they could find. Um, there were five, correct? Didn't you do five of these, I, I, I seem to remember? Yes. Um, the three of them were used at the, at the reenactment. And the Watsonville Santa Cruz JACL, <laughs> because when they bought it, I was there, when they bought it, I said, when the hell are you going to hang that? I mean, this, this is not a small piece of work here. Um, so you heard the story of how they did it, how they put it up, and you know you two things. One, it's brooded. Not all the camps had towers this tall. Truly, was a maximum security prison. They had jail cells. All right, this this was different. It was a different place, and that's where Howard grew up. 
with all of the contention and all of the discussion going on between the various you know, factions within the Japanese community that are arguing about this. Um, so it's, it, it's broody. It's really broody. Um, but the other thing, and this is something that maybe Moss will mention as well, they liked it, they picked this one out because of the dust. One of the things that Universal, amongst all the camps, all ten, was that they were built in the middle of nowhere, and when the wind blew, <clears throat> there was dust. Dust in everything, all the time, in your clothes, in your food, everywhere. And so you, you, you get a sense of dust here, uh, as well as um, it's, those are almost eyes up there, aren't they? Those windows looking down. It's almost like the United States government is looking down. So what Howard has left us is a legacy. And we are honored and thrilled that the Santa Cruz Washington Post, JBCL, went out and now we got one and put it on the wall. But here's the deal. One of the things that Moss and I always say is, you know, there's generations of historians not even yet born, and archaeologists, okay. So there's some archaeologists who will be born too, but most of them will be historians. And they will be asking the questions that we all ask, that I ask that generation who were here in 1942 and who let this happen. And my question to them was, including my own parents, was, where were you? Where where were the reasonable people? I can understand, you know, there's some nailings that we'll never get, but the reasonable people. They're going to ask that about us. Where were we? What did you do? What did you do in 2018 when the law held were saying? Hey, what have you been doing? You know, I, I, one of the things you could do, if you haven't done it already, Join the Santa Cruz Watson on JACL. <coughs> that you will do. That will set wheels moving. One of the Muslim women who came down in our forum last year, we, we, we asked her the same question. What, what can we do? And she was very eloquent and very simple. She just said, say something. Whenever you hear it, whenever you see it, have the courage to say something. Thank you. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Mas Hashimoto, retired Watsonville High School history teacher. For over 20 years, Mas has spoken and continues to speak to about 3,000 students and adults a year about the incarceration of the Japanese Japanese Americans during World War II. Today he will summarize how the Civil Liberties Act came about with an inside story perspective. Good afternoon, and thank you for coming to our event. My name is one, two, five, two, four, D. That's my federal prison number. I was a prisoner of war during World War II, held by my own country. I was six and a half years old. I had no charges, no attorney, no trial, no due process of law. How many of you received the apology and $20,000 reparations. Show of hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, thank you. You're the ones who suffered and struggled through our wartime incarceration. And in that struggle for liberty and justice, you laid the foundation, a solid foundation, for our future generations, the Sansei, Yonsei, Gosei, and Hapas, who today enjoy unprecedented freedom and acceptance in this country. I hope they appreciate their sacrifices. 
To me, the Issei pioneers and the young Nisei children are the real heroes of our Nikkei nation, and we must never forget what they did for us. Now, where were you 30 years ago yesterday? Do you remember? I do. Marsha and I were both in Seattle, Washington, attending our very first national JACL convention. It was a wonderful convention, and we will never forget it. On August 9th, 1988, half of the delegates took a red-eye flight to Washington, D.C., cleaned up in the restrooms of the Capitol and offices of our congressional representatives, attended the signing ceremony, and then exuberantly came back on a plane headed for Seattle. When they returned to the convention, they were like zombies. They were so happy, happy zombies. Now, what is the story behind the redress and reparations movement? Well, you saw part of it in the film Days of Waging. Arthur and his staff put their claim together in 1948, and it was a tragic 10 cents on the dollar. We had first experienced that in 1942 when we were evicted from our homes, when we had to sell our possessions at huge losses, 10 cents on the dollar. Then again in 1948, my family didn't submit any claims. We didn't have any papers, documents, to claim our losses. Those papers were destroyed in 1942. You know, unlike other communities, the Japanese, Japanese American community had to make their fortune twice in this country. Would you believe that the government had plans in the 1930s in anticipation of a coming war to incarcerate us and to bring Japanese Latin Americans along with Italian and German Latin Americans to this country to serve as hostages in prisoner exchange? They couldn't exchange me. I'm an American citizen. You cannot exchange an American citizen for another American citizen. I'm sorry. Fred Korematsu. The decision of the Fred Korematsu case of 1942 was delayed, withheld by the Supreme Court until December of 1944. Only after President Franklin Delano Roosevelt had been successfully re-elected for his fourth term. The Korematsu decision legalized our incarceration as a military necessity. That same month, the court granted Mitsue Endo her liberty from the camps because the Justice Department and the War Relocation Authority conceded that Endo was a loyal and law-abiding citizen and that no authority existed for detaining her and other loyal citizens any longer. The Mitsua Endo case was a positive move duly noted by the JACL. In 1945, we were free to leave the camp and given $25 and a train ticket. But where would we go? We were not welcomed back in many parts of Washington, Oregon, and California. We saw those no jam signs in the stores. Returning Nisei veterans went into the stores and ripped up those signs. We cannot and must not forget the contributions and sacrifices made by our young adults, men and women, of the 100 442nd Regimental Combat Team, Military Intelligence Service, 
and other military units, and we are eternally grateful. Over here are the names of the 203 Japanese Americans, men and women, who served gallantly from him during World War II. And we're so grateful to them. Then in 1952, the Walter McCarran Act, supported by the JACF, granted citizenship to alien Japanese for the first time. Here at the Salinas Rodeo Grounds, our first camp, Salinas Assembly Center. In the 1980s, our senior center, Issei members, now proud United States citizens, sang their favorite song, God Bless America, with hands over their hearts. They were grateful. I have to tell you the story. My mother, never from Japan, she finished sixth grade. She didn't like school. And her son became a school teacher. <coughs> she didn't like school. And she didn't like to take tests. And I was giving tests every week. I said, Mom, you could become a citizen of the United States now. And she asked, what do I have to do? And I said, you have to take a test. She said, forget it. <laughs> Japan has, has learned its lesson and won't do that again. During the civil rights movement of the 1960s, important events took place. Japanese Americans locked arms with African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, women, and others marching. In 1970, Edison Uno proposed a redress resolution at the JACL National Convention. What a novel idea. It passed overwhelmingly. Sadly, he was to die six years later at the tender age of 47. Today, we honor Edison Uno as a civil rights visionary. President Gerald Ford rescinded Executive Order 9066 during the celebration of the bicentennial, the 200th birthday of the United States. Then, in 1978 at the Salt Lake JECL Convention, a resolution calling for a $25,000 reparations was passed by the delegates. In 1979, Hawaii Senators Daniel K. Inoue and Spark Matsunaga introduced a bill creating the bipartisan mission of, excuse me, Commission of Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians Act. Our John Tateshi, executive director of the JACL, was against it for it meant delay. Impatient with congressional delays, Tateshi wanted to ram through a redress bill now. Wise Dan Inoue is convinced that a fact-finding congressional commission, the report of which was absolutely necessary before Congress will act. And he was right, of course. In 1980, President Jimmy Carter signed the bill to create the commission. Tateshi wanted a majority of the commissioners to be Japanese Americans. Only one was appointed, the wise and learned, learned Judge William Maritani of Pennsylvania. When Tateshi goes to speak to the judge, the judge stops him. John is not to communicate with them in any manner. The independence and integrity of the commission are sacred. Starting in 1981, the commission will visit nine cities to hear heartbreaking testimonies. 
Watsonville JACL, as it was known, will participate in providing written testimonies. On a personal note, I was against reparations. I thought it cheapened what we were trying to do. Then I read about an elderly Issei man in LA, now living on $5 a week for food, just like it's down the sheet. I had tears in my eyes. Then $25,000 wasn't enough. By law, the JACL cannot actively <coughs> lobby members of the Congress. Therefore, an organization sponsored by the JACL, the Legislative Education Act, what we call the LEC, was established with Grant Ujifusa as the chief strategist and Grace Uehara and others to lobby the members of the Congress. Grace often would sit quietly in a congressman's office for hours, for days, until the congressman gave an appointment. You can imagine how uncomfortable the secretaries were. Many of them became our advocates. Meanwhile, in 1983, Aiko Yoshinaga Hersa, a researcher hired by the commission, found in the National Archives the final report, a box, a final report on Japanese evacuation from the West Coast. It was to have been destroyed in 1942. In it, intelligence sources agreed Japanese Americans posed no threat. The government prosecutors had lied, withheld information, and distorted the truth before the justices. It debunked the wartime administration's claim of military necessity. Aiko just recently died in July of this year in Torrance, California at the age of 92. Her discovery changed everything and we are grateful. The commission's final report Personal justice denied. Concluded that military necessity was not justified. That our incarceration was based on race prejudice, war hysteria, and the failure of political leadership. Thus, in 1984, the Gordon Hirabashi, Min Yasui, Fred Korematsu verdicts were vacated, not overturned, vacated. But the decision in the Korematsu case that legalized our incarceration remained as military necessity. That meant the government could do it all again legally. The government can imprison anyone without charges, without the Bill of Rights. However, most recently, with the Trump versus the Muslim, Hawaii Muslim travel ban case, the court disavowed, not overturned, our wartime incarceration. But the court merely substituted one injustice with another. Military necessity was replaced with national security. On Constitution Day, September 17th, 1987, a more perfect union opened at the Smithsonian. I call your attention to this poster. It taught millions of visitors about our unjust incarceration. Watson was well represented in the exhibit. The theme came from Pete Hironaka. So he was a high school senior in 1945 and his yearbook. We're now allowed cameras. His yearbook from Post and Camp 2. 
the theme was a more perfect union. The union was not perfect. We've got to make it more perfect. These guys still believed in the Constitution of the United States, even though it was denied them. There's two drawings here by Pete Kiranaka of the Nisei and of the Nisei and Nisei. And I hope you can find time to take a look at it. It tells the story, our story. On the same Constitution Day, Congressman Tom Foley of the state of Washington introduced House Resolution 442 before the members of the House. He later became Speaker of the House and still later Ambassador to Japan. When the bill was introduced each year, the clerk of the House would wait, 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 and then he would slip in. 442. It wasn't okay, by accident. It was planned to have the bill submitted as H.R. 442 in honor of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. And we're honored today to have Lawson Sakai of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team here today. Thank you. In 1988, H.R. 442 passed the House. How did that happen? The Democrats had regained control of the House, and the House chairmanships changed. Congressman Barney Frank of Massachusetts was made chair of the important House Judiciary Subcommittee on Administrative Law and Governmental Relations in the 100th Congress. In this position, he was the one staunch architect, supporter of redress and reparations, and he got it to the House floor. And we are deeply indebted to him. Lobbying the members of the Congress face to face was the LEC committee of Grace Uehara, Cherry Kinoshita, Peggy Liggett, May Takahashi, Judy Nizawa, Rudy Tokiwa, and Grant Fujifusa. They lobbied the Democratic and Republican members of both houses, and there are 535 of them. Meanwhile, the fundraising cam campaign continued with the LEC. 240 members of the Watsonville chapter donated their fair share and more. And thanks to the dedicated efforts of Ben and Yoko Kometa. The JACL, the oldest and largest national Japanese American organization with thousands of members, pushed for action. We had the support of the Jewish community <coughs> and the black Americans, which proved pivotal. NCRR submitted letters and sent petitions for which we are also grateful. On Constitution Day, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the bill by a vote of 243 to 141, with 38 not voting. Hmm. The majority of Democrats in the House voted for the bill 180 in favor and 43 opposed. Robert Matsui of Sacramento, who was born in camp, voted for the bill. So what? He's not entitled now to the apology and reparations. Normanetta said, present. Leon Panetta and Nancy Pelosi voted against the bill. More than a third of the House Republicans favored the bill, and we are grateful for that. On April 20th, 1988, the United States Senate overwhelmingly passed the bill by a vote of 69 to 27, 
with four members not voting. A majority of the Democrats voted for the bill, 44 in favor and seven opposed, while a narrow majority of Senate Republicans voted for the bill, 25 in favor and 20 against. How remarkable is that? Well, Hawaiian Senator Spark Matsunaga called in all of his chips, all the favors that he had done for others, he called them in. He was a most likable senator. That's why a majority of the Republican senators voted for the bill. He was to die 21 months later of cancer. We are grateful to him. Our senator, California senator, was Senator S.I. Hayakawa. He was dead set against the bill. He believed we deserve neither an apology nor reparations. He was Canadian by birth. Became a naturalized citizen. He taught semantics. I had a class from him at San Jose State. He was the president of San Francisco State during the Asian American Studies campus demonstrations in the 1960s. Marsha went to San Francisco State. The campus smelled of tear gas all those years. Senator Dan Inouye insisted the funding be an entitlement program so that incarcerees would be granted the reparations. The funding for education was curtailed. However, today we have funding grants from the National Park Service. But the entitlement program was short by $400 million. You see, there weren't 60,000 of the 120,000 still alive. 82,000 of us were still alive. You say, sushi is good for you. <laughs> the Justice Department created the Office of Redress Administration, which had to discover those who were entitled and to receive reparations. Even those who denounced the United States and received their U.S. citizenship, regained it, we're entitled to the apology and reparations, what we call the no-nos. Short by $400 million, Bob Matsui and the Secretary of the Treasury rigged up a plan. The Secretary would place all the income of the government from whatever sources, and he would hold it for 72 hours for the bank interest. The interest in three days amounted to $400 million. The youngsters, are the, like me, are the beneficiary of Bob Matsui's action with the Secretary of the Treasury. For two years, President Ronald Reagan promised that he would veto the bill if it came to his desk. Representative of California, Dan Lundgren, who was a commissioner, opposed reparations. He'll be seen in the photo that we'll present a little later. What changed the president's mind? Grant Ujifusa, editor of the powerful The Almanac of American Politics, This book comes out every two years. I bought this one in the year 2000, $75, not cheap. <laughs> the book is known as the Bible of American Politics. If he called on a member of Congress, an appointment was quickly scheduled. Everyone in Washington knew Grant Ujifusa who, by the way, is a member of our JACL chapter. 
Grant had a friend who had previously served as a writer before becoming the governor of New Jersey, Tom Keene. Governor Keene and President Roosevelt were to campaign by car for local New Jersey Republicans in the upcoming midterm elections. If there was a letter that the president could read while in the car, he might <coughs> change his mind. We had to get a letter to Reagan. A letter from whom? Who? A Masuda. Why Masuda? Who is Masuda? Kazuo Masuda was drafted in the first peacetime draft into the U.S. Army in 1941. When the war began in 1941, Kaz Kazuo was in limbo until the 442nd was formed. He wrote home that if he was killed, he would like to be buried in his hometown, Fountain Valley, Orange County. He was killed in August of 1944 in Italy. The Masuda family left Gila River Camp in Arizona in early 1945 for Fountain Valley. The city fathers, they refused the burial of Kazuo Masuda. No jets are allowed in the cemetery. General Stilwell went to pin the Distinguished Service Cross on the mother, but the mother refused, saying, you took away our farm, you took away our home, you put us in prison, you take away my son, he comes home in a box, and you want to give me a medal? No, thank you. She refused. The medal was pinned on the daughter, Mary. June, the sister, Masuda, didn't want to write that letter to President Reagan. 442nd Regimental Combat Team Rudy Tokiwa of San Jose went down to LA. He was driven, he couldn't drive. He was wounded. He couldn't drive. So Judy Nizawa drove the car. And Rudy convinced her to write. And the letter was present, presented to President Reagan. What was in that letter? We'll soon find out. Can you go? <clears throat> November 19th, 1987. Dear President Reagan, thank you for taking the time to read my letter. Perhaps you recall a very special day for our family, December 9th, 1945, in Santa Ana, California, when General Vinegar Joe Stilwell awarded a posthumous Distinguished Service Cross Medal to my brother, Kazuo Masuda. He was killed in action on the banks of the Arno River in Italy on August 27th, 1944, while serving with the 442nd <coughs> Regimental Combat Team. You were then Captain Ronald Reagan and joined General Stilwell after his 3,000 mile flight from Washington. All of you came, I feel, not only to honor cause, but to help calm great hostility in Orange County to Japanese Americans. People at the time did not accept us as Americans, even after my brother's death. The local cemetery, for example, refused to accept my brother's body for burial. The presence of you and General Stilwell greatly affected the community and led to a better life for our family. After General Stilwell pinned the medal on my sister in front of our farmhouse, I have enclosed a photograph, there was a ceremony at the Santa Ana Bowl. General Stilwell said, the amount of money, the color of one's skin, do not make a measure of Americanism. A square deal all around, free speech, equality before the law, a fair field with no favor, obedience to the majority. An American not only believes in such things, but is willing to fight for them. Who, after all, is the real American? The real American is the man who calls it a fair exchange to lay down his life in order that American ideals may go on living. And judging by such a test, Sergeant Masuda was a better American than any of us here today. 
You then rose and said the following words. The blood that has soaked into the sand is all one color. America stands unique in the world, the only country not founded on race, but on a way, but on a way an ideal. Not in spite of, but because of our polyglot background, we have had all the strength in the world. That is the American way. Mr. and Mrs. Masuda, just as one member of the family of Americans speaking to another member, I want to say for what your son Kazuo did, thanks. Many times I've been asked to speak at the Kazuo Masuda Middle School. I speak to all the history classes and quote your words to the students. I bring this up to you because our family feels that what you and General Stilwell said in 1945 are as true and important as ever, the ideals for which all good Americans should be willing to fight and die. My brother did both, even though his parents and family were stripped of all their American rights and placed in an Arizona internment camp. The words also express why so many of us in the Japanese American community so deeply support redress legislation, legislation now pending in Congress. If the legislation comes to you, I hope you will look upon it favorably. And all of us in our family, I believe cause as well, would be greatly honored if you would. I also believe that America, through you, would honor itself. Yours truly, June Masuda Goto. Paul, can you hit the mic? This is a video of the signing. Lights off in the back two cases. Thank you all very much. The members of Congress and distinguished guests, my fellow Americans, we gather here today to right a grave wrong. More than 40 years ago, shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry living in the United States were forcibly removed from their homes and placed in makeshift internment camps. This action was taken without trial, without jury. It was based solely on race, for these 120,000 were Americans of Japanese descent. Yes, the nation was then at war, struggling for its survival, and it's not for us today to pass judgment upon those who may have made mistakes while engaged in that great struggle. Yet we must recognize that the internment of Japanese Americans was just that, a mistake. For throughout the war, Japanese Americans in the tens of thousands remained utterly loyal to the United States. Indeed, scores of Japanese Americans volunteered for our armed forces, many stepping forward to the internment camps themselves. The 442nd Regimental Combat Team, made up entirely of Japanese Americans, served with immense distinction to defend this nation, their nation. Yet back at home, the soldiers' families were being denied the very freedom for which so many of the soldiers themselves were laying down their lives. Congressman Norman Manetta, with us today, was 10 years old when his family was interned. In the congressman's words, my own family was sent first to Santa Anita Racetrack. We showered in the horse paddocks. Some families lived in converted stables, others in hastily thrown together barracks. We were then moved to Heart Mountain, Wyoming, where our entire family lived in one small room of a rude tar paper barrack. Like so many tens of thousands of others, the members of the Manetta family lived in those conditions, not for a matter of weeks or months, but for three long years. The legislation that I am about to sign provides for a restitution payment to each of the 60,000 survivors, Japanese surviving Japanese Americans of the 120,000 who were relocated or detained. Yet no payment can make up for those lost years. 
So what is most important in this bill has less to do with property than with honor. For here, we admit a wrong. Here, we reaffirm our commitment as a nation to equal justice under the law. I'd like to note that the bill I'm about to sign also provides funds for members of the Aleut community who were evacuated from the Aleutian and Pribilof Islands after a Japanese attack in 1942. This action was taken for the Aleut's own protection, but brought property was lost or damaged that has never been replaced. And now in closing, I wonder whether you permit me one personal reminiscence, one prompted by an old newspaper report sent to me by Rose Ochi, a former attorney. The clipping comes from the Pacific Citizen and is dated December 1945. Arriving by plane from Washington, the article begins, General Joseph W. Stilwell pinned the Distinguished Service Cross on Mary Masuda in a simple ceremony on the porch of her small frame shack near Talbert, Orange County. She was one of the first Americans of Japanese ancestry to return from relocation centers to California's farmlands. <clears throat> Vinegar Joe Stilwell was there that day to honor Kazuo Masuda, Mary's brother. You see, while Mary and her parents were in an internment camp, Kazuo served as staff sergeant to the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. In one action, Kazuo ordered his men back and advanced through heavy fire, hauling a mortar. For 12 hours, he engaged in a single-handed barrage of Nazi positions. Several weeks later, at Casino, Kazuo staged another lone advance. This time, it cost him his life. The newspaper clipping notes that her two surviving brothers were with Mary and her parents on the little porch that morning. These two brothers, like the heroic Kazuo, had served in the United States Army. After General Stilwell made the award, the motion picture actress Louise Albritton, a Texas girl, told how a Texas battalion had been saved by the 442nd. Other show business personalities paid tribute. Robert Young, Will Rogers Jr., and one young actor said, blood that has soaked into the sands of a beach is all of one color. America stands unique in the world, the only country not founded on race but on a way, on an ideal. Not in spite of, but because of our polyglot background, we have had all the strength in the world. That is the American way. The name of that young man, I hope I pronounced this right, was Ronald Reagan. Yes, the ideal of liberty and justice for all, that is still the American way. Thank you and God bless you. And now let me sign H.R. 442, so fittingly named, in honor of the 442nd. Mr. President. Mr. President. Mary is here. Mary. Mary. This is this is Mary. Huh? No, I'm sorry. No, 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 I'm sorry. Sister. 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 Sister.
Thank you all again, and God bless you all. I think this is a fine day. by which we went to prison on April 27, 1942. And over here is the Civil Liberties Act of August 10, 1988. And we are grateful. We, we've had so many good friends in our country and community for which we are grateful. Today, in the Smithsonian, there's a new exhibit, Writing a Wrong, and it features the incarceration and the apology and reparations, for which we are tremendously grateful. So if you are in Washington, D.C., be sure to see the World War II exhibit and followed by writing a wrong. The Office of Redress Administration paid out more than $1.6 billion to more than 82,250 persons of Japanese ancestry who were incarcerated, including, get this, 189 Japanese Latin Americans who were eligible for full payment, and 145 who were paid much less, only $5,000. The Office of Redress Administration closed its doors in 1999. There are Japanese Latin Americans still seeking full redress. It's not over yet. We still have some work to do. They've organized what's known as the Campaign for Justice. This is a tragic chapter in the history of our nation, said Attorney General Janet Reno. It was a time when we took away the liberty of an entire community of Americans. I wish someone would one day find out how much the government spent on our incarceration. There's 10 major camps. There's 69 different facilities in which we're kept. Now I would like to introduce our newest board member of the JDCL. Mia Norton, who was a teenager when she participated in our reenactment Liberty Lost Lessons in Loyalty in 2002. The Japanese American Creed, written by Mike Masaoka in 1941. May 92. Japanese American Creed by Mike M. Masaoka. I am proud that I am an American citizen of Japanese ancestry, for my very background takes, makes me appreciate more fully the wonderful advantages of this nation. I believe in her institutions, ideals, and traditions. I glory in her heritage. I boast of her history. I trust in her future. She has granted me liberties, and opportunities such as no individual enjoys in this world today. 
She has given me an education befitting kings. She has entrusted me with the responsibilities of the franchise. She has permitted me to build a home, to earn a livelihood, to worship, to think, speak, and act as I please, as a free man equal to every other man. Although some individuals may discriminate against me, I shall never become bitter or lose faith. For I know that such persons are not representative of the majority of the American people. True, I shall do all in my power to discourage such practices, but I shall do it in the American way, above board, in the open, through courts of law, by education, by proving myself to be worthy of equal treatment and consideration. I am firm in my belief that American sportsmanship and attitude of fair play will judge citizenship and patriotism on the basis of action and achievement and not on the basis of physical characteristics. Because I believe in America and I trust she believes in me and because I have received innumerable benefits from her, I pledge myself to honor, to have her at, times, at all times and in all places to support her constitution to obey her laws, to respect her flag, to defend her against all enemies, foreign or domestic, to actively assume my duties and obligations as a citizen cheerfully and without reservations whatsoever, in the hope that I may become a better American in a greater America. Again, May 9, 1941. Thank you, Mia. A better American and a greater America. Those words are true today as it was in 1941. Our mission remains. We must support, support our fight for civil rights and social justice for all in this country. Thank you. for your insightful presentation. I know we're running a, a bit over, but if, if you will indulge me, I, I would now like to present a local story about redressing reparation in honor of Watsonville's Ben and Yoko Uneda. At this moment, Yoko and her family are attending the third year memorial service for Ben, but I am honored to share their story. In early 1979, Ben, who served as our JCL president in 1965 and again 10 years later in 1975, was appointed to serve as Watsonville JCL's redress representative by President Wally Osato. As our local redress chairman and to request monetary contributions toward the National JCL's redress fund, a job that continued for nearly 10 years, a decade. Pen, uh, Ben's wife, Yoko, who served as our first woman president in 1983 and 1984, assisted Ben, and they were an amazing team because this was a daunting task. In 1979, the initial preparation for the Civil Liberties Act was to determine how the JCL members felt about seeking redress, a most critical decision. A letter explaining the reason for redress, and along with the questionnaire, was sent to about 300 local JCL members. The purpose was to get their thoughts and opinions on pursuing redress. The 10% questionnaire return was disappointing, but the 100% approval for redress by the JCL Senior Center <coughs> members was encouraging. Ben and Yoko's positive support then followed with a second letter stressing the urgency and need of membership response to the questionnaire. This time, there was a high number of returns with an overwhelming approval to proceed with redress movement, and more than 90% of the respondents favored the individual monetary reparation. <coughs> After the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians was established in 1981, and hearings scheduled, 
Department of Justice representatives came to Watsonville to get personal testimonies directly from members of our community. With the help of translators, many Issei and senior members expressed the hardships of the incarceration and of their return home. Former attorneys were also urged to send their testimonies to commission. To promote the redress campaign to our chapter members, then requested speakers that included Fred Koromatsu, Commission Member Judge William Maritani, Board Chair of National JCL's Legislation Education Committee, Min Yasui, National Redress Chair John Tateishi, and Grant Ujifusa, Vice Chair of the Legislation Education Committee and Legislative Strategy Chair. The long uphill struggle for justice which started in 1970, came to a close on August 10, 1988, when President Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act, H.R. 442. In order to hasten the payment for the uh, redress, Senator Daniel Inouye, through his long experience in, in the Senate, along with Senator Hollings of South Carolina, was able to get the Congress to make redress payment an entitlement. From the very beginning of the National JCL's redress movement and fundraising, the Watsonville JCL supported it with generous financial donations, thanks to the leadership and untiring efforts of Ben and Yoko Umeda. Our chapter did an outstanding job in meeting all the fundraising, all the fundraising drives requested by our National JCL. Ben and Yoko were given a tremendous task in seeking support and financial aid for redress and reparations. It is a credit to Ben and Yoko and to our chapter members and community members who generously donated time and again when they were struggling with personal finances that including sending their children to college. What an amazing and dedicated membership we had then and how it continues to be an organization committed to civic social, and legal justice. Last month, Moss and I attended the National JCL Convention in Philadelphia, and I am proud to say that JCL continues to be a relevant organization in responding to civil rights and social justice issues, and we unanimously passed the following resolutions. Resolution 1. JCL National Council directs the National Board and encourages districts and chapters to pursue and support re revisions to US, U.S. immigration policy to uphold constitutionally protected due process, equal protection rights of all, and to end indefinite detention of immigrants with pending immigration proceedings to pursue and support revisions to current U.S. immigration policy that guarantee that families seeking asylum in detention are not separated, and that the U.S. government employ monitored supervision in lieu of family detention, and oppose the conversion of U.S. military bases and construction of additional facilities intended for the mass incarceration of undocumented immigrants, including potential sites at former World War II Japanese American incarceration facilities. Resolution 2, JCL National Council calls upon the Congress to pass legislation to curtail the discriminatory policies and practices included in the travel ban, the National Board, staff, and, ch and chapters strengthen ties of mutual interest and support with Muslim American civil rights organizations such as CAR to protect the civil and human rights of Muslims placed in jeopardy by the Muslim travel ban and all JCL chapters reflect on the history of Americans during World War II in light of the current prejudice and hate directed against Muslim Americans and offer assistance and support when and where possible. JCL is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Our membership is open to everyone and we welcome your consideration in becoming a member. In closing, I would like to thank Sandy Leiden and Masa Shimoto for presenting an informative and insightful program in celebration of the Civil Liberties Act and for helping us honor Howard E. Kimmel. 
I would like to extend appreciation to Watsonville Santa Cruz JCL board members for their efforts in making this celebration possible. They are volunteers dedicated to serving our community and presenting educational and cultural events and activities throughout the year. Please hold your applause as I ask our board members to stand and be recognized. Dr. Ginny Matuke Bianchi, Joe Bowes, Jeanette Hager, Masashura, Carol Kaneva, Vicky Kimura, Kimi Kamar, Cindy Hirokawa Minet, Gary Minet, Amy Mizuno, Mia Norton, Dr. Brock Brooke Reigns, Norris Whitford, Jean Yamashita, and a special thanks to Kimawi Yamashita for his exceptionally beautiful one side on display. Thank you. Victor for pointing that out. Members and friends, thank you for your attendance at this afternoon. We appreciate your supportive interest. Please enjoy the refreshments provided by Cindy, Ginny, Jean, Carol, Mia, Kitty, Amy Mizuno, Kasuko Kurosaki, and, a, and our gratitude to Kenny Kusumoto for donating the sweet and ever so popular Crystal strawberries. <laughs> Thank you.